time of my talk from Saturday. Uh, thanks to you for coming to listen, uh, and thanks to the conference organizers. So I want to talk to you today about our research on how novel sequence can be useful in evolving novel function. Uh, this is a, a really a multi-year project that's uh, spearheaded by Victor Luria, uh, who works in the uh, uh, systems biology department in, at Harvard Med School in Mark Kirshner's lab. Uh, and there's a number of other sides to this project uh, that I won't have time to get into today, but Wes Kane has done a lot of work with Victor on a math model. Uh, Anne O'Donnell has done some more of the bioinformatics. Taran and Harry are doing uh, work now for laboratory uh, confirmation of the, the biophysical predictions that we're making uh, with bioinformatics programs, and Brad Olson did some of the early algal sequencing work. So evolution, uh, as, as we all know, tends to tinker with existing, uh, existing genetic sequence. So in, with gene duplication, when you copy a gene, you're free to mutate the second copy of the gene. Uh, and this is how we generate gene families. But when you do that, then the sequence in the second gene is, of course, identical at first to the first gene, and gradually it may change a little bit, but it seems less likely that you'll be getting truly new domains or truly new functions out of that. Uh, you know, maybe over very, very long stretches of time, but certainly in short time you wouldn't expect to. So really, there's, there's sort of two models for change that we can imagine. Uh, the first, in analogy to classical music, I hope I don't offend anybody who's a classical music fan, is to uh, you know, take ideas from your predecessors and, and gradually change them. Uh, but every once in a while, uh, people move into sort of new regions of, uh, of music space, and, and we think the same can be true in DNA. So de novo genes are genes that arise from intergenic DNA. Uh, so if we have a, a slice of intergenic DNA here that's got a, a stop codon in it, Every once in a while, a start codon might accidentally appear uh, through mutation. A promoter might appear. Another stop codon might appear. And there's you know, going to be this uh, rapid, well, rapid or slow sequence of, of mutations that are going to cause different pieces of genes to appear and disappear. And over time, just by chance, you might get all of the pieces of a gene uh, that you need in the right place at the right time. And so the important thing for our purposes is, is that if this happens, then you'll have a novel sequence, which is to say sequence that has never been translated before in evolutionary history. And so that means that if you make a protein from this sequence, it's going to have no homology with any known proteins, uh, and it may, be, may create entirely new domains that have never been seen before. Uh, I was sort of skeptical that this could happen very often, uh, but it turns out that many de novo genes have been found by many labs over the last 10 years. They've confirmed them with proteomics and, and other, uh, other tools. Uh, but generally, th these the findings have been done either in small batches or large batches in a single, se uh, single species. And part of that is due, uh, due to the, the way they were doing these studies. They wanted to look at how these things appear, and so they had to prove very carefully that these are de novo genes. But the, the truth is that our interest, as I mentioned, is just looking at novel sequence. Um, and we want to look at how novel sequence may be useful across, across eukaryotes. And so we're willing <clears throat> to accept sort of any kind of novel sequence um, including, for example, overprinting, where you take an existing mRNA and translate it in a plus one or plus two frame and get entirely new amino acids that have never been seen before, uh, or you know, starting to translate a, a non-coding RNA. So how are we going to find a novel sequence? We use the phyllostratigraphy method that was developed by Dieter Tauss's lab, and phyllostratigraphy basically takes the idea that a, a protein's age can be approximated by looking at uh, homologs across different species, or how widely it's spread across different species, phyla, kingdoms. Um, and if you uh, take, so you can take a protein and blast, uh, for example, a zebrafish protein, and blast the protein against all known proteins in NCBI's uh, NR database. Uh, and you can look for the most distant hit, in other words, a hit that's in the most distant species from zebrafish that you can find. We use a, an e-value of 10 to the minus 3, which is really a very lenient way of looking for, uh, looking for alignments. Uh, so really, we're going to find lots of hits as far away as possible uh, within the phylogenetic tree. And then you, if you find something in, say, sponges or starfish, you can work your way up the phylogenetic tree and suggest that the least, last common ancestor of zebrafish and starfish uh, uh, had to have that gene as well, the gene that makes that protein. So as I mentioned, you know, just uh, if you find something that's got a lot of homologs across the eukaryotes, then it's going to be an older gene. If you find something that only is found in vertebrates, it'll be substantially younger. And if it's found only in zebrafish, we're going to call it a novel protein. 
uh, which is to say, again, that it's, it's a sequence that hasn't been translated before. So the main question of, of our, that we're looking at is whether this novel sequence can be useful to the organism or the species, and then how can it be useful? So I, I alluded to this earlier. Um, can novel sequences be a major source of novel domains and novel function? After all, you know, that picture I made with the intergenic DNA, it may seem very unlikely that you'd get all of the pieces of a gene through random mutation with no selection uh, appearing in, in the right place at the right time. So if only one of these genes appears every billion years, it's unlikely that you'll get a lot of, uh, a lot of novel, novelty out of it. Uh, but uh, Victor, uh, my collaborator Victor and Wes, built a math model that actually suggests that thousands of unique novel proteins will be found in any given genome. Uh, and of course, they, there are thousands that are unique to that genome, not, not seen in others. Um, and so even though you may lose a bunch of them to mutation very quickly, uh, if, even if you only retain a few every million years, that's still enough to be a, a major source of, of domains that, again, unlike gene families, you're getting an entirely new domain here. Um, and actually, you know, I think this is particularly relevant with the, uh, the keynote speech that we just heard about how disordered proteins, even if they don't have domains, can end up being uh, particularly useful to the cell. So the bioinformatics part of this project, which is what I was mostly working on, it was to find and study novel proteins at scale. And scale means we want to find the thousands of new proteins in each genome, and then we want to look across many genomes across eukaryotes to see, uh, to see whether this is a general pro uh, property of biology as opposed to just how one particular species is doing this. Um, we measure their age using the, we, the, using the phylostratigraphy method that I mentioned, and then we try to, try to ask whether these proteins, the new proteins, have common biophysical traits, and more importantly, can those common biophysical traits be useful to the cell, to the, to the species in some way? Um, and then as long as we have old and new proteins, we also ask how do those proteins change as they age? Which characteristics change at what rate? Uh, I, I mentioned we're trying to look broadly across eukaryotes, and so we have, we're looking at a plant, we're looking at uh, yeast, uh, then we do a bunch of, of uh, we do a bunch of uh, insect species, and then once we get to the chordates, because we, uh, we feel that, you know, novelty may be particularly useful in, uh, in nervous systems, we're looking more deeply at, uh, at things with, that have nervous systems, and in particular mammals, and, and for example, we're looking at three different rodent species to see whether novel proteins work the same way in these different closely related species. And so at the end of the day, we've studied about 20 gene, uh, uh, more than 20 genomes, we've looked at over 100,000 proteins, and we measure uh, around 100 biophysical traits for each one of those, uh, for each one of those proteins, and then we uh, try and see what we can see. So here's a picture of the 31 uh, phylostrata, the 31 different uh, branches between uh, bacteria till you get to, uh, to Homo sapiens. Uh, here at the bottom, we have uh, uh, gene, pro genes or proteins that have homologs in bacteria, and then uh, here we see that actually most genes in, in humans do have homologs in bacteria. Many have homologs in eukaryotes, and then as you move up, you're, ha you're looking at proteins that have uh, fewer and fewer homologs um, across, across eukaryotes. So, uh, you know, human genes with homologs only in mammals, so there's only 69 of those. Uh, but we do find, as the math model predicted, that there are over 1,700 genes that have homologs um, in, no other, in no other species. And by the way, that's 96 percent proteomically confirmed. So it's not just, you know, predicted uh, genes. These are genes that we know are actually making proteins. Uh, now, if we want to look at other species which do not have exactly the same phylogenetic tree as, as uh, humans do, uh, what we do is we take those 31 phylostrata and we smush that down into five different eras. Uh, but we still find the same trends. 80% of genes in humans are ancient, 8% uh, are more recent than the split from chimp. And if we normalize that to the length of these eras uh, and to, to account for positive selection, we see basically that there's a large reservoir of these newest genes uh, in humans. And what's great is that we see the same kind of pattern in lots of other species as well. So many species have hundreds or thousands of uh, uh, you know, species, uh, including fruit fly, as we move farther away, have, uh, have thousands of uh, genes that are available uh, to, to do, well, we'll find out what they do. So the pipeline that we use for each species is we download all the proteins from Ensemble, we add some proteomically confirmed proteins from the literature, if they're newer, um, we measure their age using phylostratigraphy, and then we take the longest and oldest isoform for each gene. The idea behind that is if we have 10 isoforms for one gene and one for another, that's going to mess up our statistics. 
we break that down into uh, sets by different age, where we have uh, 200 to 2,000 proteins in each set, so we make sure we've got good statistics. Uh, and so we've got a, you know, two, two billion year old genes that are shared uh, across eukaryotes. We have middle aged genes shared across mam uh, mammals and then land animals, and then uh, you know, young and, and the ones that are found only in the species. We also take two more, um, uh, two more sets of possible proteins, so we translate intergenic sequence, which you would expect to be very similar to the newest genes, to the newest proteins, I should say, um, because the newest proteins very recently were intergenic sequence. Uh, and then we take random DNA and translate that as well. And then we run uh, all of our different biophysical predictors on it and try and see if there are uh, generic, uh, generic properties of these different sets. We run a whole bunch of tools, including um, a bunch from Burkhard Ross uh, Predict Protein Suite that look at secondary structure, uh, protein and DNA binding sites, as well as looking for signal peptides, transmembrane domains, et cetera, uh, many different tools um, that we can find. So I'm going to show you a few of these pictures, and so I just want to give you a quick introduction. Basically, we have here, um, this is the length of the different, pro the average lengths of the different protein sets. These box plots have median and interquartile range, and then uh, 90 percent within the, within the whiskers. We've got the oldest to newest here, so and then uh, the, the the possible proteins, the intergenic uh, translated intergenic sequence and translated random sequence over here. And you want to keep your eye here on the the newest proteins, uh, which we'll be comparing both to the intergenic sequence and we'll be looking at how the newer proteins change as they get older. And so what you see here, this has been found by other groups, is that newer proteins get longer as they get older, generally by pulling in new exons. Um, but uh, because we did see this trend, and again, we saw it in many different species, uh, we normalized for length uh, in, in, many of our, in much of our later work. So we see that novel proteins, uh, when we look at predicted protein binding sites, we see that novel proteins are quite similar to interge translated intergenic sequence. Um, and uh, as it happens, novel proteins, uh, are, if they're likely to bind to many different proteins, or at least have many protein binding sites, it makes them more likely to uh, join in with existing gene networks because right now when they're first created, they don't actually do anything. Um, and then over time, these, uh, you, you imagine that the, the proteins as they get older will bind with more specificity to fewer things. We see a similar trend in zebrafish. So I'm mostly showing you the human graphs, but we've done these graphs for many different species. And we see uh, you know, similar trends in different species. And we see a similar, uh, we see a similar trend for DNA binding as well. Next thing we looked at was, was propensity to, perform, to, to create uh, plaques uh, that are toxic to the cell. So what's interesting here is that the new, the new proteins are quite different than the, intergenic, than the uh, translated intergenic proteins. And uh, that's be, uh, you, we imagine that that's because the, uh, you know, as soon as you make a protein that creates plaques in the cell that are toxic, that won't stay around even long enough to be fixed in your species. Um, so the new, the new uh, proteins are quite uh, innocuous, you might say. And then over time, as proteins gain more function, even if they end up creating plaques when you're old in Alzheimer's, um, the cell may be willing to keep those around because they're old and have, have some other function. Uh, and we see, we see similar trends in, uh, in prion formation as well. And then if you look at, uh, if you look at the uh, exposure to water, new proteins tend to be very disordered, which again relates, I think, to the, the keynote that we heard earlier. Uh, and then over time, they gain more structure, they become less exposed to water, which also means that they are less exposed to proteases that would, that would uh, degrade them. Uh, we see a similar picture with, uh, with Ken and D boxes, where, uh, which would, would uh, cause new proteins to be targeted more often for degradation by the proteasome. So rather than show you 97 more graphs, I'll just show you that we've looked at a whole bunch of trends, and we're starting to look at correlations between these trends. I'd be interested, for example, in looking at the correlation between the disorder uh, and, and uh, some of the, these other properties that we're looking at based on today's talk. Uh, and we've also done some RNA-seq with Michael Greenberg's lab at, at uh, Harvard Medical School. So here we've got the newest genes, and you can see that about 50% of them are expressed above the uh, general background level. Uh, you might call that cellular noise, uh, but you can see here that even the, the primate, uh, sh genes shared with primates are expressed, 30% of them, uh, are expressed above a, uh, a background level, and so that suggests that you know these are probably things that have stuck around long enough that they actually have some function. And so the the emerging picture that we're seeing is that the these new this novel sequence can be like a polite guest that's joining a functioning genome. So de novo genes we see across a whole bunch of species they encode proteins that are numerous, that are non-toxic, that are expressed. Uh, 
that are expressed above the, uh, the general background level and that are rich in protein and DNA binding sites. And these traits happen to be traits that will help novel genes join into gene networks, uh, hopefully before mutations inactivate those genes. So answering the question we had earlier on, it looks like th uh, they can indeed be a possible source of novelty. Uh, and because genomes are basically the intergenic sequence in genomes is a large and dynamic reservoir of ore sequences that will gradually get, uh, get translated, um, and they may generate truly novel structures. So these de novo genes may provide a mechanism for evolvability, um, and we see that evolution does not just tinker with old parts, but rather it can make entirely new things. Um, so just very quickly to tell you about the uh, current and future work we're doing, we're going to be making our mathematical models more fancy. We want to do lots more, uh, lots more biophysical prediction with more genomes. We're actually starting to do lab work to, uh, to look at protein structure. We'd like to get some NMR structures because new proteins don't really have very many solved structures. Um, we're looking at functional expressional exp expression experiments in the brain of some of these new genes, and we're uh, interested in doing some uh, genetics work with human subpopulations to see whether there are some de novo genes that are only in particular um, subpopulations. And then finally, I'll be doing a poster today uh, from 6 to 7.30, and if you'd like to talk more about that, I'd be happy to uh, talk to you then. Thank you. <laughs> so as you show that those new gene, uh, de novo genes have reached uh, the uh, protein binding sites, right? Yep. But as what I know that those de novo genes can all limited express, uh, not that broadly expressed, and normally they can all ex highly expressed in the uh, male productive uh, mm -hmm. organs. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether that's because even though those new genes have uh, lots of the binding, pro sorry, protein binding sites, but they may also lack other key elements to be expressed. It wouldn't right. be surprising. I mean, they mm -hmm. are new, so they still mm -hmm. don't know how to do anything. Um, but mm -hmm. we also see them expressed in brain and, and, and other places. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they may be that's where thing, I think ten, things tend to be expressed at first. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, these genes are just learning how to do things. So, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thanks everybody. Um, that's the end of the uh, function cozy. And we're just beginning the uh, technology track now. So, my name's Dominic Clark. I'll be your chair today.